Good evening and welcome to the City Hall and this special joint meeting of the, our City Council, our Murfreesboro Planning Commission, and our Murfreesboro Airport Commission. And at this time I'll call to order our City Council and I'll ask Vice Chair Doug Young to call the Planning Commission to order and then Chairman George Huddleston, Jr., to call the Airport Commission to order, if you'll do that, please. Mayor, we have a quorum, and the Planning Commission is called to order. All right. Mayor, the Airport Commission has a quorum, and we're called to order. Thank you. We're happy you're here, and without objection, I will serve as the presiding officer of this special joint meeting. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention early on is one of the reasons we're having this meeting is that we had a public hearing at our planning commission and at that time uh, after the public hearing was closed and after a considerable amount of discussion the planning commission moved to defer the issue that was before them at that time regarding the airport extension and the uh, airport kind of the piece that's called the airport layout plan and we'll get some more information on that uh, but it was moved to defer for uh, asking for a study to be commissioned, and that is part of the information that we'll be receiving tonight. So the Planning Commission has already had their public hearing. They have moved to defer, and they will address this issue at a uh, meeting to be held perhaps on June the 7th. And uh, then the City Council will have a uh, depending on what the Planning Commission does, the City Council will have a public hearing at some time in the future. So there will be an opportunity to speak uh, regarding these issues at the City Council level at a date uh, to be set later based on what our Planning Commission does. There will be no public hearing tonight. Uh, at this time, we'll have the presentation of the update of the proposed airport layout plan, and I'll ask our airport manager and our only full-time airport employee, Mr. Chad Gerke, to uh, go ahead and make the presentation, uh, if you will, at this time. All right. Thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council and uh, Vice Chair Doug Young and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, with me tonight, I'm not going to be the lone one up here. Also is uh, David Schilling with Atkins, Darren Duckworth with Atkins, Tim Haskell and Joanne Bingham from Hanson. Also joining us from MTSU is Dr. Uh, Thomas Cheatham, the Dean of the College of Basic and Applied Sciences. Uh, Terry Doris, the Chief Pilot for MTSU. And uh, also with him is Paul Mosey, the chief flight instructor with MTSU. And uh, at one point when we get into uh, some of the MTSU talking about the aircraft, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to them on, on those issues. Would you explain uh, to, to what Mr. Adkins, I mean, uh, Adkins does with David? Uh, give us a little brief. Sure. If you uh, run through that. Adkins and uh, Hanson are a team of consultants that were selected when uh, we went out for uh, qualifications to conduct the airport layout plan. And in this case, we really have, we have two different firms and, and uh, Hansen is conducting the planning portion of these projects as a five-year contract. And Hansen is doing just the planning, so basically the airport layout plan. And Atkins is going to be covering all the engineering, so uh, they will be covering up kind of behind. But in, they, they work together right now at this time to help us coordinate things as we go through the, uh, we worked really closely with Tennessee Aeronautics Division and also the Federal Aviation Administration in setting up the plans for this airport layout plan. And, and these plans are not exceptional plans. They are just plans that are required uh, to operate an airport. Is that correct? That's correct. And although I'm sure our consultants would like to think that their plans are exceptional, <laughs> they, uh, they are the plans that we're, we are required to come up with these every five to ten years. We have grant assurances. When we, when we, have, uh, when we accept federal monies, there are certain things that we have to do and uh, to, to keep our airport up to standard. And uh, every so often we have to do that. We have to make sure that we're meeting the standards. Of course, standards change from time to time. We have to see if our airport is still up to standard. We look at our, our, uh, our need that the community puts on us as the airport and also our customers. What do they need out of the airport? Are there any changes? So that's why we do an airport layout plan. All right, and then Darren. 
Darren, uh, Darren is part of the team with Atkins, and he's going to be our chief engineer, I believe, on this project and uh, any future projects that come with the, the capital part of this where we actually, we just don't write on paper. We actually dig some dirt and build something. And then Troy does? Uh, uh, we have Tim and Joanne with our uh, Hanson, and they are the planners. And you mentioned the name Troy, I thought. Did I just uh, miss that? Yes. Okay, I, don't have I have a Terry Doris. Maybe it's Terry. That's Terry is the uh, chief pilot with MTSU. He is the chief pilot on the King Air. And uh, with, with a different purchase of an aircraft, he would be the, the lead pilot on that as well. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Steve, if you could uh, get me going. You already took my first slide there, Mayor. I was going to try to explain an ALP, but you already beat me to it. But the... Uh, uh, one of the important parts, too, of, of the airport layout plan is once you put those projects on the drawings, then they become eligible for federal funding. That's why it's, it's another reason it's so important to have these airport layout plans and up-to-date. The city of Murfreesboro has updated their air, airport layout plans several times over the last 60 years. And another part of that is that the airport layout plan for Murfreesboro becomes part of what is called the NIPIUS, which is a national plan that puts us in the network of all the other airports in the nation. Uh, through the years, one of the demands that we have had from, from pilots is runway length. It's, it's always been a concern with the pilots. In fact, back in 1970, when the city council was looking to purchase great parts of McKnight Park, which became our Starplex and Sportscom and McKnight ball fields, part of it too was part of the airport was purchased with that, with that farm as well. And that 1970 airport layout plan actually had a runway that was 4,950 feet long. Now, I don't know why, what happened in between, but, but it was in there. And with what's these, the length now? I'm sorry? What's the length now? 3,890. Okay. Uh, 98. The, um, the problem with uh, another thing occurred in 2007 uh, was that uh, MTSU was looking to purchase an aircraft and actually had to take the second bid because the low bid did not, uh, it required 5,000 feet of runway. With, the, with our customers asking for it, with, with our largest tenant asking for it, we looked at our airport layout plan, it's not on there. So we came to the council and administration back in 2008 and asked permission to go out for a request for qualifications to hire consultants to look at that. The scope of work included a study of the runway protection zones, runway length, terminal area, and sufficient area for future MTSU growth. The status of the proposed airport layout plan. So in the meantime, we had our consultants go to work and uh, do a great deal of job. We started about 2008 and uh, working hand-in-hand -hand with the Tennessee Aeronautics Division. Um, the Airport Commission had certain uh, uh, choices to make through this time, and one of them was an alternative, runway alternative, and there were several drawings that were proposed to them, and they selected one. And that prompted another meeting that we had out at the airport with both the Planning Commission and the City Council back in December 16th of 2010. And we presented that alternative of the runway of 1,102 feet with the extension to the north. We also included estimated costs and time schedules and things like that. Following that meeting, the City Council approved a state and local agreement and contract with our consultants to perform the environmental assessment of a runway extension of 1,102 feet. The airport plan then continued to progress through the Tennessee Aeronautics Division and Federal Aviation Administration. Hansen conducted the environmental assessment and sent that on to the FAA after public hearings. And then we're at the local adoption process right now with the Planning Commission, uh, public hearing of February 1st. That was when, as you mentioned, Mayor, the uh, economic studies were requested. I think it's important to uh, understand some of, the, some of the issues of the airport layout plan, the purpose and need study, our aircraft fleet mix, and how the recommended runway length was determined. We have often used the term, we're a B-2 airport, we're going to stay a B-2 airport. And I want to explain to you what that means uh, because it's something we've said a lot, but there's, there's a lot to it, and it really sets up the whole dimensions of the airport layout plan. B-2 is one, of the, is one category above the smallest and slowest approach speeds of aircraft. The first 
uh, letter that you see refers to the aircraft approach speeds. You can see A through E, and the approach speeds are anywhere from less than 91 to 91 to 121, 121 on. We are B. Our aircraft that fit our category is 91 to 121 knots approach speed. The next part, the number, is the design group, and that's based on the aircraft wingspan. Again, you can see anywhere bef before less than 48, up to 49 to 78, and so on through the various numbers. We're a two. We're at 49 feet to 78 feet. Uh, not much different uh, wingspan than, than what makes up this, this table here. Just to keep it in perspective, a bunch of you were probably at the uh, Smyrna Air Show a couple weeks ago. The primary runway where our Blue Angels were going all over the place, that primary runway is a D4. You can see the separation between the runway and the taxiway is quite immense, but it kind of puts it in perspective of where we are in, in, that, uh, in that grouping of aircraft. Now, if you're doing an airport layout plan, and for some reason, because of customer needs or whatever, uh, the, the recommendation is to change your design groups, then there would be a, a very uh, dramatic changes to the airport's design, such as the runway taxiway separation, the size and area of the runway protection zone, just to mention a few things. This proposed airport layout plan does not recommend any such changes to our design of our basic airport. It stays the same. Let's look at our aircraft fleet. What kind of aircraft are coming in and how many? We have uh, aircraft operations from 2008 when this, uh, when this project started. And uh, we're looking at mostly, predominantly, a single engine aircraft of about 48,000 uh, operations. And an operation is any time an aircraft takes off or lands as an operation. Our multi-engine is dramatically lower at around 3,200. Turboprop. Uh, much like the King Air that MTSU flies and many businesses use, is 416. And some jets, we do get some small Citation jets in and things like that, 210 operations and a few helicopters. You can see our turboprop is about 0.8% of our operations and jets 0.4%. With our forecasted aircraft operations with the runway extension in place, you can still see there's a slight change. Uh, we're looking at about 1% growth per year, but our operations over a five-year period goes from 52,000 operations to about 54, as we are forecasting. We also take a look at the uh, max weight of the aircraft. This is important. Uh, we, as you can see, our largest aircraft in there listed on the left-hand side is the King Air and Jetstream and MU-2, they're the turboprops that most represent the, those type of aircraft that come into the airport. Again, anything less than about 14,500 pounds. A few jets come in of the Citations, the Lear being the most heavy at around 20,000 pounds. Please note that the max takeoff weight of the majority of the aircraft now and in the future will be less than 15,000 pounds. The current runway has a single wheel weight limit of 30,000 pounds, dual wheel about 50,000 pounds. The future air, airfield pavement overlay that we're going to have to do this next summer is designed not to improve the weight bearing capabilities, just the condition of the surface of the pavement. So we're not going to change our ability to take anything heavier, just get the cracks out of the asphalt and, and make a smoother surface. Our consultants take all the information that they've gathered and apply it to a FAA advisory circular and some formulas that are in that circular, the 150-5325 called the runway length requirements for airport design. And the end result, one of them, was the Jetstream 31 replaces the King Air 200 as a critical aircraft for Murfreesboro. Uh, at this time, uh, this is a time where I'd like to have uh, Terry Doris stand up and, and talk a little bit about the, uh, the importance of the Jetstream 31. It's critical to this airport layout plan and it's critical to their flight training and, and transportation operations. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Terry Doris. I've been at Middle Tennessee State University for 24 years. I've served many functions. I've been the leader of the, uh, the program for flight training for maintenance management, and now I'm currently the, I guess you'd say the most senior faculty member, I hate to say that, in the uh, ProPilot program. And I'm also 
flying the King Air 200 for the university. Uh, five years ago, in 2007, we had to go out for bids, like everybody has to do when they do something for the state. And uh, luckily, we came back with the lowest bid with a local company. It was corporate flight management out of Smyrna, Tennessee. Very excited about that opportunity. It gave us an opportunity to work hand in hand with a local business, a Rutherford County business. Very excited about the aircraft because I had experience in the aircraft. Very excited about the capabilities of the aircraft. And I called the insurance company. Would not insure us. Would not allow us to operate the primary aircraft that we were really interested in purchasing for MTSU because of the runway length. Plain and simple, that's what kept us from purchasing that aircraft. So I had to break a law for the state of Tennessee and not take the low bid. I had to go to the second bid aircraft, which was a King Air 200, and any of you that had bid, that takes almost an act of Congress not to take the low bid. Uh, it also hampered our operations because the King Air 200 does not have the seating capability or the hauling capability of a jet stream. So we had to take second choice when we purchased the King Air 200. If the runway had been long enough, we would have purchased the jet stream. Uh, we use that aircraft for training. I fly it with students in the right seat acquiring experience to go out and be your airline pilots. Uh, it's amazing how many times I get on an aircraft going somewhere for Southwest or American or Delta and recognize one of the pilots. Uh, it's almost scary. Sometimes I want to get off the airplane. <laughs> Uh, we, we have done this. This is not something new that we do at MTSU. I actually started this program in 96 with an aircraft that I got of surplus that uh, we, parted, so we started providing this service for the university and for primarily for our students to give them the opportunity to go somewhere. Last week I carried Dr. Cheatham and a group of students to Washington to participate in a meeting. This aircraft gives us great capabilities, but I'll be honest with you, I had to restrict Dr. Cheatham on how many students he could carry up there because of having to go with our second choice. It would have been better for me, it would have been better for the university, it would have been better for, for Dr. Cheatham's students if we'd been able to go with the cheaper aircraft. Let's forget the money that we would have saved by going with the cheaper aircraft. It would have just made a better operation. We didn't have that opportunity strictly because of the length of the runway. Uh, it's a safety issue because, you know, I'm good but I'm not the best. So when the insurance company looks at my experience and my qualifications and the aircraft and goes, okay, we're not worried about you flying this airplane. We're just worried about you stopping this airplane in the length of distance that you have at this airport. So we had an option. Our option was to relocate this whole operation to Smyrna. And I know that's come up before. Why don't we just move everything at Murfreesboro to the Smyrna Airport? Well, MTSU is Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro is MTSU. We're not Smyrna. We have, we have dedicated millions of dollars into the airport operation to stay at the Murfreesboro Airport. We're not going to Smyrna. We're here to stay. We want to be in Murfreesboro. So much so that, again, I broke a law and took the second bid so I could stay in Murfreesboro with the aircraft that we have. Uh, I'm going to look at my notes because I want to make sure I cover everything. Primarily, it, I, I would like to see the extension and the Murfreesboro Airport remain where it's at because it is convenient for our students, but I would like to see the extension for the safety of our flight training operation. I know you guys that live in Murfreesboro see us every day. We're out there every day flying around, and it would be nice to know that this green student that I've just soloed and turn him loose above your heads has a little bit extra runway to get himself down safely. Uh, please make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Garkey. Thank you. Um, so with that, with the studies, the numbers that were given to us through MTSU and the data collected, uh, MTSU looks like the uh, King Air, the Jetstream would replace the King Air 200 as their primary aircraft. 
The other item then is still that we would still maintain the B2 category of airport. And with the formulas applied, the FAA circular, and including the insurance requirements, the 5,000 foot was still considered the best, uh, best situation here for this airport layout plan recommendation. Let's look at the uh, changes in the aircraft pattern and the proposed extension of the runway. We only have the one runway, so we have two departures and two arrivals. The approach to the north, runway 36, even with the pr proposed runway extension, there's really no changes. You can see a drawing there of, a, of an approach triangle, kind of the direction that the aircraft would be coming in to land. You can see even if we extended the end of the runway, no real changes there. Departure to the north, runway 36, even with the proposed runway extension, no changes, except if that pilot would lose an engine, he's got a little bit more pavement to uh, stay up on but no changes really to the departure. On, this, on a south approach to runway 18, I have a drawing up there for you of the uh, runway extension and the north uh, side of the uh, airport, and you can see the uh, undeveloped land uh, in between the uh, Bradford Place and, and uh, State Farm area. That's really where the uh, aircraft mostly approach. Uh, this is a picture that was taken for the GIS uh, city in 2011 and if you look really close you even see an airplane on its approach over the over the wooded area there uh, that really puts it I think in perspective of that approach uh, it's the approach to runway 18 is really the best approach with land directly under that that has remained undeveloped for the last 60 years now there are future plans for at least one of the two parcels of land to be planned for develop of commercial use which is still very compatible with the airport and even with the runway extension. And there's a, a, a look at the north side and most of the uh, uh, pattern as you see uh, aircraft are coming over the Pitts Lane area, coming over the fields and kind of shoot around the uh, anywhere around the Osborne Lane area south and north of it depending on the approach speeds of the aircraft. Some of the larger aircraft will, will go out to near Compton Lane and then come in over the grassy areas north of DeJarnet and then in, onto airport property after they cross DeJarnet Boulevard. Uh, please note that when the aircraft is transitioning or coming around to land typically with the piston engine aircraft they're pulling back the throttle and even with the turboprop and jets, there's some reduced power settings, uh, making it probably one of the more quiet parts of the flight. We listened to the uh, concerns of our neighbors and the, and the concerns they had over the lower aircraft because of the runway extension. And we asked our consultants to go a little bit beyond the airport layout plan. We're actually asking them to step out, go ahead of us a little bit, a few chapters ahead, and actually look at the design of the runway and the approaches and see what they could do to assist with, with the approach. And our consultants ended up showing us a range of possibilities that could be used during the actual design and construction of the runway approaches. The key is the location of the approach lighting and guidance system. And in that, uh, in that drawing there for you, I, I have a, a, a depiction of what that lighting system does for pilots. Uh, you can see two big red lights at the end of our runway if you drive by to Um uh, This is a, a different system that will go in, but basically these lights tell the pilots if they're too high or too low or on glide path. Now, the, uh, this drawing is the orange line is the existing runway. The pink is the proposed end. And what we're looking at here is depicted three approaches for runway 18. The blue line is a standard approach for our current runway with a 20-foot threshold crossing height. The aircraft is crossing the end of the runway at 20 feet above the ground. They don't land right at the end. They usually land a little bit ways down the runway. We looked at the extension of the runway and we looked at a, a crossing height of over 40 feet, which would bring the aircraft up higher out in the distance onto the runway. And then another one that would be more optimum for the aircraft and the pilots that crosses the, the end of the runway at 20 feet. Now, when designing the approach, if you increase the height that those aircraft are coming in on, then you give up runway length that they have to come to a maximum stopping distance. So right now on a standard approach, we have around 3,528 feet left remaining for maximum stopping distance. If we come in a little bit higher at 40 feet, 
we have around 4,260 feet left. If we come in at the maximum, we'd around, come in around 4,630 feet left of the runway. So even though you have a 5,000 foot runway, you may not have all that to stop on. Then we looked at what that height would be at those various ranges of, of distances down the runway and, and crossing heights. And the standard right now, if you're crossing uh, Dejarnet Boulevard, Dejarnet Lane, you're around 139 feet above the ground. And I put a little star there as to where Dejarnet is. 40 foot threshold height would be around 100, 20 foot 80. So there's a difference of about 39 to 50, 59 feet in, in altitude there, depending on where that pappy would be located, that guidance light would be located. Again, the same with Osborne Lane, about 307 feet today. 268 to 248, again a 39 to 59 foot difference. For the departure, so that's there are some changes there, but there could be some uh, uh, things that could help that approach. For the departure to the south using runway 18 with the proposed runway extension, there's an improvement in that the aircraft will be higher as they depart airport property. And I show that with the blue line being existing, taking off from the existing end of the runway, and the gold line there showing if you're taking off a little bit further north that you'll get up off the ground and be crossing the south end of Murfreesboro at a higher altitude. The changes to the approach, improvements to departure runway 18, no change to runway 36 for departure, no change to arrivals for 36, and changes to arrivals of runway 18 in a range of 39 to 59 feet. Let's talk about the aircraft size and the sound levels associated with the proposed runway extension. The current list of aircraft that, are, that we see at Murfreesboro will not change. This is, a limit. this is the list of aircraft that you see that were in the purpose and need, including the King Air, the Mitsubishi, the Lear, the Citation, Merlin, and Jetstream 31. These are the aircraft that you'll see. Uh, I've given you some pictures there. They're all the typical larger aircraft that operate out of Murfreesboro, and uh, except that the, uh, nothing is going to change in the forecast except the Jetstream would take the place of the King Air 200. Murfreesboro will not see larger turboprop or jets than what we have already seen because our runway weight bearing capability would not allow heavier and larger aircraft to operate here. The airport's runway weight bearing capabilities are listed on the airport facility directory. The pilots reference the information before they come into an airport. <coughs> Besides runway length, and the weight bearing capability of a runway. Another item that there's any notes that will help a pilot come into, a, into an airport. One of them that's at Murfreesboro is extensive flight training operations. Some of the business aircraft will just not want to come in and mix with flight training and that's, that's acceptable. That's another reason though why we don't see larger aircraft here. We will not see Boeing 737s or any airline offering service at Murfreesboro. The assumption that we've also heard is that larger means louder. A concern that we have heard in the community is the runway extension will allow for larger aircraft to come to Murfreesboro and those aircraft will be louder and will have a negative impact on the community. Larger or just because the aircraft is turboprop or is a jet is not always equal louder. A study was done at the Oxford Airport in the United Kingdom which dealt with this same issue. The study was uh, given to me by uh, Bob Soglowski of uh, Kelly Close. And in these slides, it shows the popular misconception. It says all jets are noisier than turboprops, which are noisier than all piston aircraft. That is wrong. The most popular training aircraft, a Piper 28, which we have at most airports across the nation, is twice as noisy as the quietest jet, a Cessna Citation Encore. This is according to an FAA certified noise data. One of the most popular aircraft that if you've ever done any flight training or gone up with anybody is a Cessna 172. And even they are noisier on takeoff than most of the popular jets. And it just so happened that this slide that they used in this study are the same aircraft that we see on our purpose and need study, the listing of the aircraft that we used in our study. And as you can see in this noise perception from the FAA advisory circular, that the jets, the turboprops, and pistons, if you look at their, noise, their sound levels, they're all very close to each other. In an AOPA guide to airport noise and compatible land use, you can see that piston aircraft and jet were around 65 to 75, surrounded by conversational speech and an, and an average street traffic. 
There's not an anticipated change in aircraft in the fleet mix at Murfreesboro, and the current and forecasted number of overall operations and jet aircraft operations are well below FAA's threshold to qualify for any additional action or studies. Changes to the airport overlay district. The Planning Commission knows this very well because this is part of the height ordinances of our community and is, the, uh, is, is surrounded by the airport. Those imaginary surfaces are out there to protect the navigational airspace around the coming into the airport from cell towers and buildings and things like that that could pop up and, and distract navigation. It will extend, of course, out 1,102 feet and, it, and encompass another 622 acres. But most of those communities are already under uh, more restrictive height restrictions for residential, industrial, and commercial. In fact, the airport overlay would allow something under, uh, under 250 and 350 feet, so you could grow quite a cell tower out there. The economic impact studies. On February 1st, the Planning Commission requested the Airport Commission report back to them in 90 days with some information regarding the economic impact of the proposed runway extension. The first study requested was an economic impact study of the runway extension itself. The second study was to come from a similar community which extended its runway and the community documented what the impact of the runway extension was on property values. An economic impact study on the extension of the runway was not a problem to have completed. There was a problem finding an economic study on a runway extension of a general aviation airport. Economic studies are not usually required or funded by general aviation airports. Most of the states, Tennessee included, won't, won't even fund economic studies. We got a portion on this one and they, because they did um, fund a business plan for a couple airports uh, we were kind of under, able to come in with that. Uh, and, and in the history, uh, looking back, a lot of it is just there's not the economic uh, studies because there isn't the economic impact, negative impact. If one existed, it was highly unlikely that it could adequately represent Murfreesboro and or its airport. Not all, all airports or the communities are the same. So to comply with the request, the Airport Commission hired R.A. Wiedemann and Associates to conduct the studies and report specific information about Murfreesboro and its airport and the runway extension. When we talk about the econ e economic factors of this airport, it's very important to note that our entire budget of the airport is a self-funded budget. Uh, we're not using any tax dollars for the operations of the airport, and any capital improvements that we make are funded back. We are paying back our debt service and all that revenue is generated from fuel sales and hangar rents. We're not using any of the local tax dollars. Again, it's all revenue generated at the airport. Even the state money that we bring in, 90 percent for some of these projects, and federal, federal monies, is gathered from taxes on aviation fuel. So it stays within the aviation community. Another important part of this uh, uh, dynamic out at the Murfreesboro Airport is our partnership with all of our businesses out there. We have several businesses that are providing flight training, aircraft maintenance, and the university. And uh, that partnership has been fostered through many years. And if, if Dr. Cheatham could come up and talk a bit about that relationship and uh, the importance of our future improvements at the airport, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, well, ladies Dean, and gentlemen, how are you? Uh, I'm Tom Cheatham. I'm the Dean of the College of Basic and Applied Sciences. I'm a Murfreesboro resident for 22 years now and uh, likely to stay, I think. It's a great place to live and uh, proud to be a member of this community and a member of the university community. We, we have a, an amazing aerospace program at MTSU. I think you know that. Uh, I'm the Dean. I'm supposed to say that. But in, in my estimation, we're one of the top three programs in the country, and we don't, we don't, we can't say that about too many programs at MTSU. We'd like to, but we can about our aviation program. We're one of the top three programs in the country. The other two that might be better, and they are better in some ways, they have more money than we do. I know that. I've been to their campuses and seen their dean's office, and it's <laughs> way better than mine. Uh, our Embry-Riddle uh, Aviation Aeronautics University and the University of North Dakota. They're both very fine programs, but in, in several ways we have a better program than they do. If we had the funding they have, I promise you we'd be way better than they are. 
But we, we do. We have a wonderful relationship with uh, uh, the airport and with the city of Murfreesboro. Um, we, we are excited about this possibility of having the runway. I had really just two points, and uh, Professor Doris already made both of them way better than I could possibly. Uh, and one is safety for our students who are learning to be pilots, and the other is the issue of being able to take a few more people with us on the plane when we go to visit the National Science Foundation uh, in Washington, D.C., or, or, or some trip like that. But our, our relationship with the city and with, uh, with Murfreesboro is a wonderful relationship. We're very proud of it, and we look forward to that continuing in, uh, in, in a good way. So thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cheatham. I'll switch now to the uh, economic study, the slides that you were you received. Again, uh, Randall A. Wiedemann was uh, was selected because he is one of the few uh, consultants that is doing economic studies for general aviation airports, the small airports. Oftentimes, he's he's been credited with a lot of reports for statewide economic benefit packages of the aviation programs throughout a state and uh, also doing business plans for airports and uh, airport businesses. To start out with is uh, some economic definitions and because each one of these is given a, a dollar amount in throughout the study. The direct spending is monies and that were on, spent on and off airport. Induced benefits were the those same dollars again re-spent the total output was the com combination of the direct spending and the induced benefits. Also, he looked at jobs and income estimated from the projects or from the airport. And then also, whenever you exchange money, there's also taxes. So what are the state and local taxes that are collected? He looked at the background of the airport, built in 1952, 225 acres, the number of, of uh, based aircraft and operations, and then also took into consideration our rapid growth. And as you can see, especially in the north end of the, of the uh, city, we had rapid growth pretty much from 1985, the early 80s on, where most, most of the development around uh, the airport occurred. Existing airport economic impact. Now, we've had some economic impact studies done before for the airport, but this one is, took a look at, a, at some more specific items, especially in the area of expenditures, not so much sales and the attraction of the airport and the relationship with the university, but just expenditures. Direct spending, uh, around $5 million. Induced spending, around almost $4 million. Total impact of $8,680,000. Total jobs, seventy two. The income to the community, $3,892,000, and state and local taxes, $235,000 on an annual basis. The future impact of capital spending. In that airport layout plan, we have a, a long list of capital improvements to make. And if we did those over a 10-year period, what would be the annual economic impact? So each year, the uh, based uh, the additional annual direct spending is around a million six. Average annual induced spending around 847,000. Annual impact of about 2,400,000. And uh, total additional jobs around 24. Additional average annual income increased 875,700 on top of our annual impact just from the airport, regular airport operations. Additional yearly state and local taxes, additional $65,800. Now let's look at just the runway. We're going to take the runway out of the overall capital improvements and we're going to look at just the runway. Now, the runway project takes about 18 months from the beginning of design to wrapping up all the funding and requests and, and, and all that. So we looked at direct spending of around almost $3 million, induced spending of $1.2 Total impact of 3950000 Total jobs for the runway project is about 24. Income, 1313 And state and local taxes collected, $98,700. Now, the other item was to look at the property values near the airport. 
the study or the uh, ana analysis that Randall Wiedemann did was a home listing price analysis. They studied an area around five miles radius from the airport. Data divided into sections based on the geographical distance from the airport. As you can see from this color chart, uh, the closer in you were, uh, one mile was over 300000 average sales price. And between one and four miles, it ranged from two hundred sixty to 280000 And four to five miles was just around one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty thousand for sale price. The, ha the highest average home price in the study area was 336000 The lowest price was around 161000 now, there's a few things that you can derive from this. Average home prices within a mile of the airport are higher than those further away. This indicates that, generally speaking, there's not a, a readily apparent area of depressed home values in the vicinity of the airport. If the findings of the average of the data had been the opposite, that is, lesser average values in the core area around the airport and steadily increasing averages as one moved away, then it might be it might have been a preliminary indicator that a deeper level of study might be required. Operations at the airport are not expected to change significantly after a proposed extension of the runway. Projected growth in turboprop and jet operations are less than the projected growth of the overall airport operations. So Randall Wiedemann came up with the, uh, the result that operations now and in the future will be dominated by small piston aircraft and because there is no significant overall change in the airport operations, no change in impact to home or property values are anticipated. When it comes down to it, the, uh, the important thing is safety. You heard MTSU talk about that, and uh, this was reiterated on Mother's Day. Well, it just became Mother's Day. It was 1235 when I got a phone call, and it was a 310 that went off the end of the runway. This was not a big plane. It was a Cessna 310. It's a small twin-engine aircraft. It was a lifeguard medical flight. It had left Murfreesboro. It did a blood run up to Pittsburgh for a uh, uh, transplant that was going on there and came back. It was raining, and the pilots did a good job. They had visual approach on the runway. They came in. Once they landed, they have right away started a hydroplane. They did everything they could to keep it straight on the runway and went off the end of the runway and off into the grass, into the runway safety areas. Um, they were lucky. They ended up about 50 to 60 feet. When I got the call, that's the first one that I've responded to, that there wasn't uh, major infrastructural damage to the aircraft. They kept it on straight down the runway, and even when they hit the grass, oftentimes when they hit the grass, they go sideways and they snap a landing gear, and then there's the damage. But they were able to keep it straight. Now, uh, rain was a factor. Runway length was a factor. Um, this pilot did a good job. Uh, he's familiar with the airport. He was an MTSU uh, uh, student at one time, so he did an excellent job. But in this case, this is another situation where uh, runway, uh, staying on the pavement, if we had the longer runway, this wouldn't have happened. They were fortunate. Ready for any comments or questions? And if there's anything that you'd like specific from our engineers or planners, I think we could take those at this time. Any questions or comments, discussion from our Airport Commission members, or from the Planning Commission members, or our City Council members. Mr. Young, uh, Mr. Gerke, it seems to me that the Jetstream 31 is not a jet. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's a terrible name, isn't it? They should call it the Prop Stream or something like that, but they didn't. I didn't. Know. <laughs> All right. On the the approach from the south coming in. Mm -hmm you're lowering your approach, is it possible to have them turn a little further north so they won't turn over a subdivision area? Because there's a, a dead spot between Bradford Place and State Farm. And what I mean by a dead spot is there's no houses under that section there. George, if you'd like to uh, just go over that with them a little bit more as a practicing pilot. As a, as a pilot, Mr. Young, the the standard way that every student pilot is taught is, is you fly until you're 45 degrees beyond the runway. In other words, you look back over your left shoulder and you see 45 degrees back, and at that point, you begin your left turn, you do a 45 degree turn to base, 
you rock wings level and you check for any, any traffic either way and then you do another standard two minute turn and the higher the speed of the aircraft the wider that turn has to be because you're just doing a two minute turn so as a result the the smaller and, and slower training aircraft make their approaches closer to the runway um, I know in I've been flying out of the airport since 79 and I've never crossed over anything short of, of um, Osborne Lane because not because of trying to do anything it's just because that's the way it works out Chad got a chance to go up with Terry on an on a maintenance flight and he said let's just do a normal approach I want to see where you come in and it was over Compton Road that the King Air made its turn on base so in that particular flight and in, in all of the flights that all of the twins that uh, the, the cabin class twins the bigger twins it's already beyond Osborne Line. In, in that case we did try to look at what it would take uh, typically Terry comes in over Osborne Lane that's a good uh, area to come in over with the King Air he said with the runway extension it would look like maybe over Compton Road so those are good geographic areas over a over a road over a, a, a corridor if you would okay, well I'm asking I got a couple more here at least mm -hmm. one more now this is my perception it could be wrong but I want to get this at least correct one of the factors on a larger plane coming in would be the insurance company. Yes. Okay. The, uh, one of the others could be the weight of the run, the, the weight pressure on the runway. Mm -hmm. and the other could be the length of the runway. Mm -hmm. the, you're not adding pavement or strength to the runway to take a heavier plane. Is no. That, is that no. my understanding? That's correct. Okay. The, the, the work that we will do to resurface the runway will be just to clean up the, the surface of the of the pavement so really you're not anticipating any larger aircraft coming in no we're not changing that and the insurance company is going to do what they want to do or mm -hmm. whatever we do we had a uh, for example just just yesterday I was talking to a pilot that came in and they they came in in a Cessna 340 they also fly a Lear 45 now we you saw on our list we had a Lear 45 come in and out of there but in this particular case the pilot said that their insurance would not allow them to come into Murfreesboro Yet other insurance companies for other aircraft have allowed it. And it's an aircraft that works in our airport, but for them, that insurance company said no. Uh, anything no, else? No, I, I might have something else on this. <laughs> Anyone else have a question or comment? Any other discussion? Yeah, I got another one. I have a public question. Oh, Mr. Smotherman, I'm sorry, Ms. Harris, I saw him no first. Problem. No problem. Chad I, or Mr. Girk, yeah, I see that we've got several more employees in the future if we go with the plan and proposing maybe 24 employees growth. Why would you have an increase in employees unless you're anticipating more flights and more activity? Part of that growth of employees was also due to the construction of, of the, the plans and the capital improvement plan. Also, if, if you had a uh, uh, any increase in the uh, uh, in a flight department there's going to be increased maintenance people or pilots or anything like that and that's where those numbers come from also those uh, aren't city employees no well, I, was, I was hoping <laughs> I understand that I wonder if I didn't know that has, has there ever been a DNL study done on the airport so that we know what the average decimal level of an airplane coming in there do, no. do we know that no we haven't and and the, the we are well below the threshold that would would allow us to get an FAA funded uh, sound level study done um, the the criteria that is is used that is mentioned in the uh, environmental assessment is 900 or 90,000 operations 700 jet operations we're at 54,000 operations and you saw 200 jet operations so we're well below that threshold and, and I guess one more question mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll be quiet uh, the I, I know there's that magic number and and even almost sounded like a dig in the hills and if we don't get it we might go to Smyrna type <laughs> attitude um, 
Is there any threshold? This plane here that ran off the runway went off by 90 feet or 50, uh, 50 or 60 feet. feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, is there a, a happy medium that could be met? Because I, I know there's that fear of larger planes coming in and, and lengthening the runway to five and, and the magic number of the insurance. Mm -hmm. is, is there any, let, let's say if the runway had been 300 feet longer here, mm -hmm. the plane would have stopped fine even though it had mm -hmm. replaned. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there's no scenario that you can't say that somebody won't run off the end of the runway right. when it's 8,000 right. feet right. and right. still run off the it end. It could still happen. We can't avoid pilot error, and, and, and that would same theory would apply to the road. We can continually make our roads wider, and ultimately nobody can run off the side of the road. But maybe, but but but, but some point in there, there's this neighborhood out there who is concerned about the the runway encroaching on their neighborhood, and I certainly understand that. The is is there any negotiation, or are we just saying we absolutely have to have five thousand feet or nothing? And I'll, I'll have Tim uh, come up here with me on this, but uh, the aircraft that we're looking at uh, with the future, with the existing operations, and then bringing in the Jetstream 31, the 5,000 feet was, was the best consideration. Uh, like you heard with MTSU, uh, the 5,000 was necessary for that for that particular aircraft. That's an aircraft that's, that's going to fit their operations uh, extremely well. Um, Anything else? Tim? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, and, and let me before Tim takes on there. Uh, as the airport manager, I have to be the the representative of the businesses on the airport, and uh, it was it's very important that uh, not to take uh, that MTSU is saying if you don't have five thousand feet, we'll move. That's not the case. You you heard how dedicated they are to Murfreesboro, this relationship, this airport, and these facilities, but. Uh, there's a concern, and, and Randall Wiedemann brought this up to me as well, and he's seen this with flight operations, whether they're a university or a business that changes equipment. Uh, they go to a different type of aircraft. Well, the, the base airport can't support that aircraft. So they still have some planes here at this airport, but they take this airplane and they put it to a neighboring airport. And what happens is eventually they can't support both operations at two different airports. And this airport gives them a little deal on fuel, and maybe there's some lease incentives to come over, and eventually that flight department has to make a decision to go to another location. Um, I have to be that advocate for the university and, and any of our tenants, the flight schools, the, the maintenance shops, all that. Um, again, our budget is very tied to the, to the uh, revenues that we can produce at the field. So I have to be that voice in that. Um, it is a concern of mine that if the university just moved, if they did get the Jetstream 31, moved it to another facility, we're out of hangar, we're out some uh, fuel sales, those things, and uh, I, I, I'm, I, it's my responsibility to bring that to your attention. And I think your question, Mr. Smotherman, was is there some compromise between the proposed extension and where the end of the runway is Exactly. Now. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. I'll, I'll just take a couple of minutes to describe the process that we go through. Um, the, in, in developing a recommended runway length, the first thing we have to look at is the Federal Aviation Requirement, what their definition of is of a critical airplane. Um, the FAA requires that if you change the geometry of your airport to accommodate an airplane, that airplane or, or type of aircraft, that airplane must have at least 500 annual operations. The magic number they use essentially is that airplane should on average appear once a day every business day of the year, 250 landings and 250 takeoffs. The King Air at, at that, that MTSU uses does not operate that much. The, the Jetstream 31 that they anticipate using will not operate that much. But by combining the turboprop aircraft and the jet aircraft, we develop a profile of the critical airplane at the airport. 
We then take that number to an FAA model that gives us the preferred runway length to accommodate those airplanes in normal day-to-day -day operation. The number we came up with and the number that the, 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 the critical runway length for those type aircraft is just short of 5,000 feet. It's in the 4,750 4, foot to 4,900 foot runway length. Combining that FAA model with runway length required with the, the typical insurance requirements of those type aircraft, the typical insurance requirements are 5,000 feet. The answer to your question directly is, yes, a shorter runway will accommodate that airplane, but m most of the owners of those aircraft will not be able to come in because their insurance companies won't let them. So a 5,000 foot runway is critical, particularly when 80% of the, of the need or the, of the critical airplane. The, the MTSU Jetstream 31 is, is forecast to have four, from 400 to 425 annual operations. It makes up the majority of those 500 annual operations. Their insurance company has told them, if it's not 5,000 feet long, you cannot operate at that airport. We will not cover it. So the answer directly to your question is, in this particular case, the answer is no. Uh, there is not a compromised runway line. Um, a longer runway, something less than 5,000 feet, will accommodate those airplanes but it will not accommodate the MTSU airplane. Thank you. Thank you. That, that answers my question. Ms. Harris, you had a question or comment? First of all, I want to thank Middle Tennessee. My hat is off to you for being, what, number two in aviation? That's awesome. I'm number one, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Very awesome. You had to bear with me a second because I've just had a... 40 minute aviation crash course, so I don't, don't say crash course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mortician, I can say crash. <laughs> okay. Couple of questions. If I'm understanding this correctly, the increase in the length of the airport. It's for safety reasons. Yes. That's the main, mm -hmm. as, a, as far as our air yes. port is concerned. Yes. Okay, and from our citizens, the main issue is noise, right? Yes. Okay. So I think in your presentation you said there would be, there would be no larger business aircrafts coming in. Right, and, and even if you did have some of those larger aircraft, some of those are quieter than some of the, the considered small aircraft. So uh, really we're not, showing, we're not showing any significant gain in the operations of the type or size of the aircraft we have. So really no net gain, no difference in the sound levels that you have now. That was a misconception I had because I always thought that yes. the larger the plane, the more noise it made. That's true. But that's not necessarily that's, true. That is not a correct statement. Okay. Currently, are there any limits on the arrivals and departures as far as the number of aircrafts that come into the airport right now? No. There's no limits uh, to that. And, and uh, I guess our numbers of operations have changed through the years because of economy, uh, fuel sales, things like that, or the different types of flight training that has occurred there. But uh, no, there's no limit that are set. Okay, and I was, I guess... It's kind of like the uh, interstate system. It's open to the public at any time to come and go as they please. I know some of the major cities now, as far as airports are concerned, they have now put a limit 
on the hours of operation these major jets can come into service. Right, and, and, that's the, and that's the important factor there is the major jets. Uh, usually it'll be airline service or something like that that can only operate at certain times. But still, typically, there'll be the smaller aircraft, the general aviation aircraft that can still come and go during that because it's not the, it's not the sound level issues that you have with the larger airliners and cargo aircraft that come in and out of night. Okay, so, and here again, I'm corrected on the heavier the flight, I mean the jet, the more noise it makes. So I guess the longer runway is needed because um, it's a lower climb out path that's needed on the heavier jets. It takes a little bit more just for physical right. to get that right. larger uh, object up into the air. Right. And, and another critical item here, is, and, and pilots will tell you, there's a critical time during that takeoff that you're going down that runway, and if you lose an engine, you want to stay on the pavement. There's a, there's a critical distance that if you lose an engine, you can pull that throttle back and still stop and be on pavement. We don't have that because we have such a short runway that's critical to those pilots to lose that. Now, we've not had, the, not had a great deal of experience with that, uh, many problems with that. We have had some on landings, like I showed you on that picture. Right. So, and that's something I learned, that mm -hmm. I always thought that we needed more runway coming in, but based on what I've heard tonight, actually, the part on, on takeoff is it's right. very critical. So, therefore... And just looking at the citizens and mm -hmm. looking at the airport, since we do not have any limit on the hours of operation mm -hmm. and the larger jets are not necessarily louder, mm -hmm. and that, that is a concern for our mm -hmm. citizens and the neighbors Absolutely. in the area, would um, we be willing or would you all be willing to put in writing that you would have a limit on the number, the frequency of flights coming in and out, uh, the time of operation. I know major cities, a lot of them, uh, these major airlines cannot uh, land some of them after 10 p.m. and can't start operation before 6 a.m. So, you know, just to kind of appease neighbors and still have the longer runway, could we possibly look at getting that in writing? So. There's there's some concerns there with the grant assurances and, and the difference there between if, if you're trying to compare us to LAX or some of the larger airports, again, there's a, there is noise abatement procedures and programs. Now, there are some things that we can do. For example, at night, we've asked our pilots to voluntarily, when they do their run engine run-up, they go to the ends of the taxiway, to the end of the runway, and they have to do an engine run-up. They throttle the aircraft, look at the throttle the engine, do some checks, and, and it takes several minutes, and they bring it back. It's a, it's a loud period, two or three minutes. What we've asked them to do at night, instead of doing it out at the ends of the taxiways where the neighborhoods are, we've asked them to do it inside the, uh, the ramp area of the airport. And uh, we've been doing it for a couple months now. Uh, Mr. Tankard is a neighbor out there, and he says he could tell a significant difference by us where we do those run engine run-ups. So that's one that's one item that we've done to try to help that noise issue. Um, I don't know of any general aviation airports in Tennessee that have have done any type of of curfew like like you're asking about. What is the latest time that we have these jets coming in? I mean. You know, it, it, typically, typically the jets are, are a business. They're doing business here in Murfreesboro. Uh, they come in typically in the morning and they leave in the afternoon and drop off the rental car. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, occasionally we have an event at MTSU or an event downtown, and these and people come in. They they do their business. They take part of the event, and sometimes they'll leave at nine or ten o'clock at night. Uh, just an example uh, uh, for Spring Fling. Uh, uh, we had a small citation jet come in here with uh, six or seven people for their baseball team. We took them over to Oakland High School. They left about 8.45, 9 o'clock at night. Um, it was, the game was over, so they went home. Um, so that's, yeah, you never know when people are going to come and go through Murfreesboro. That's all the question I can think of right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gilly. Chad, are there other planes besides the jet stream that the extension of the runway, given the weight 
classification. Are there other additional planes that would be able to come in above and beyond the types of aircraft that come now? I, still, you'd still be within that same class of aircraft, although I may not have mentioned a, a certain type of aircraft. They'd still be within the same categories of the aircraft that we see now. Those, the ones that I've listed are ones that we have seen, and uh, I, nothing else larger or extreme would be different. It would be the same. It'd be a just different name, Ford or Chevy, same type of aircraft coming in. And Ms. Harris asked that, that one of the questions I had, and that was about limiting access time-wise and curfew and that sort of thing. You've, you've addressed that. Um, other than MTSU, are there other individuals or entities with planes like the jet stream that would then access the airports in addition to MTSU? I, I haven't had a big. I haven't had a big request. We, the airport layout plan was not. Uh, Put together with any other companies or anything like that in mind. I had one individual, a construction company here, that is keeping a Citation jet in Smyrna. Um, they indicated that they'd love to be able to keep it here, but the runway is a is an issue to them. Um, we'd still need to work out space and hangars and all that stuff. So really, I've had only one informal conversation with somebody about basing another type of aircraft here. Okay. And one last question I have for you is: Explain to me, please. The fact how it comes into play that our airport is not tower controlled. I've had some pilots tell me, with it not being tower controlled, that means that you, there's, there is no way to control. If a plane thinks it can land on that amount of space, we can't stop it from coming in. I've had other pilots tell me we're not going to try to land a plane if it's not tower right. controlled if it's a certain size. It's What's where's the truth between those two? Okay, non-towered and towered airports. Um, I started my flight training at a towered airport, and uh, I, I liked it because uh, I always felt like somebody else was watching out for me as I tried to learn how to navigate through airspace and land. Um, but then there's also the freedom of the non-towered facility. Now, it's not just free come and go as, as you may picture it to be. There's a definite pattern that the aircraft have to follow and they're talking to each other. They announce who they are, where they are, and what their intentions are at each turn that they make. So it's very much a I'm doing this and you're announcing what you're going to do and we're going to keep track of each other as we go. There's a very good open communication. And some, in, uh, some prefer a non-towered facility over a towered facility. Um, there isn't the um, it's just a little bit of free, freer flying, but it's still a very controlled and very um, uh, safe manner in which we fly. A majority of our airports in our country are non-towered facilities. Uh, very few are towered. Uh, I think we're talking about 4,000 general aviation airports. The majority of those are non-towered. Smyrna is our closest towered facility in Nashville. Uh, and I said that was the last question, but one other. As far as MPSU's insurance is concerned, has anyone approached, since you know we brought this issue up at the, at the planning commission level, actually someone from the audience, I don't remember who it was, but we'll give him credit for, basically what Mr. Smotherman had suggested, if it's a matter of safety and needing to be some longer than it is, why not something short of 5,000? If the jet stream could be landed on less than, than 5,000, has anyone approached, since that topic came up, the insurance company and said, here are the concerns that we have in, in can you insure us for something short of the 5,000 feet? Terry, you have any input on that with the insurance with the university? Uh, we haven't we haven't reapproached them because we bought our aircraft. We bought the King Air 200 because they will allow us to operate it in the airport link that we have. We have not approached them to see if they would do it with 4,500 or 46 okay. or 48. Now you just brought up another point. You've already purchased. Yeah, we've already got the air. We you, bought it five years ago. And you got it, and. and plans for buying another one or how far into the future? Well, who knows? Uh, you know, money becomes available, opportunity becomes available, need becomes available. We may purchase one next year. But we can't purchase a King uh, Jetstream 31 because we can't operate it on our runway. And uh, Mr. Smotherman there, I want to point out that we're not going anywhere. I mean, I heard it twice that, you know, there's that fear that we may be the big you know, bully and say, well, we're going to take our toys and go somewhere else. We're not doing that. We have invested in Murfreesboro. We're not going anywhere. We're staying at Murfreesboro. 
I, I know you said that, but I just want to set the record straight. We're not going anywhere. If you want us out of Murfreesboro, you're going to have to close the runway. I, I didn't imply who said it, so <laughs> we, if you feel guilty, it's okay. <laughs> we're, here, we're here to stay, and, 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 and like the dean said, uh, we developed a great program here. We're going to stay here. So, and, and we want you to stay here. Thank Let me you. make we, it clear. We, we really do. We don't. Want, and I've been involved in many meetings discussing the opportunities to go somewhere else. And it always goes to Smyrna. And we're not going to Smyrna. We've already made that decision many times. So, in answer to your question, we've not bridged that gap. We've not had the need for it. As far as safety for your student pilots. Would you agree with me that some additional runway short of 5,000 feet would add some additional safety for your, your student pilots? One foot addition would add safety. Absolutely. But there's that kickover point, just like Tim pointed out, that 5,000 feet is not only desired, it's pretty much necessary if we are going to ever go to anything larger than what we're operating now. But under the, the planes that you have now, and you said you, you bought your plane for now, um, an extra three or four hundred feet would add some safety cushion. Exactly. One foot would add safety. Uh, somebody pointed out, I didn't mention the takeoff aspect of it. When I take off in the King Air, I don't have an option. I'm climbing out. If I lose an engine on takeoff, I'm climbing out. Now, if you'll extend the runway, I might opt to stay on the runway and go home drink a beer. But I'm climbing out in that King Air when I release the brakes. I don't have any option because of the length of the runway. That is a big safety concern for me and the 10 students that I carried to Washington last week. I think about that every time I power up to take off. 5,000 feet, I would think about it, but I wouldn't sweat like I do now. It's just a short runway. I mean, you can go to any other runway in the 25 mile or 50 mile radius. Even Smithfield has 5,000 feet. So some compromised distance would increase safety, but it continued to prevent larger aircraft from being able to come in. Thank you. Okay. Mr. McFarland. Mayor, I, I've gotten several phone calls and, and emails, so I just want to, you know, part of our job is to bring questions that we have from the public, so I want to, I've got a list of questions here, and I don't expect you to answer all of them, but I sure would like to get, uh, you know, maybe whenever we can get some, some recommendations or, or some answers. I don't think from the people that I've talked with, I don't, um, I think the main issue is property value. You know, our, our homes are our main investments that we 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 will ever purchase. So, the the questions that we had or that the people have emailed me um, on our economic impact uh, assessment, we show that within a mile of the airport, the average price is close to three fifty. And you know, I live off of. Haynes Drive or in the Sulphur Springs area, so know that in that mile category you have, you know, the Bradford Place, you have the Hamptons, you have uh, the Pitter School and, the, and Celebration Cove, those subdivisions, but you also, you've got Northwoods, you've got Mirabella, um, so that it seems like if we're looking at economic impact and we're taking um, Looking at those subdivisions, there may be some some homes that skew both directions. Mm -hmm. So, the one question I had was, can we see what a what the median is, um, <coughs> and, and maybe like you would on a bell curve, take out the high, take out the low, and let's see where we where we are. So that's the the first um, question. The second one that um, had that attached or it's regarding HUD guidelines on selling mm -hmm. a house that would be government back that uh, it's brought up that it would eliminate the future selling of homes that would fall within the clear zone that we're saying that um, that we would the noise zone that we wouldn't fall in that category but then a, a uh, resident contacted HUD directly and they said yes it would be applicable yeah, I'd like to I'd like to answer that one because the HUD the the reference that you have there deals with commercial airports, and that deals directly with the runway protection zone or the clear zone as a runway protection zone, okay. and that runway protection zone stretches for commercial airport, and it says that on the report in small letters commercial airport, 
it stretches 2,500 or 2,500 feet off the end of the runway. Our runway protection zone is a thousand feet, and is and on the north end is on airport property. Even with the runway extension, we we would uh, purchase an navigation easement, so none of no properties, nothing like that would be in the runway protection zone. So it's not an applicable thing to that. It's if if you're looking at a commercial airport with airline service, yes, not here. But we would have that, and I'm sure the airport commission has talked about this. We would have that in writing or from HUD or something, we would confirm that. that we're not it, yeah, and you can confirm it on the HUD documents because it says commercial okay. airport. Okay. And we're, we're not a commercial airport, we're general aviation. Um, we got, we all received an email regarding noise levels mm -hmm. and, and what's acceptable for residential areas and it says the recommended noise level would be not exceed 65 decibels um, that we weren't applicable because we were a B2 airport. But when this resident called the state and they spoke to an individual named Paul Perry, mm -hmm. they said that it was applicable. So that would be something that... I'm going to refer to Tim here with the uh, noise uh, studies and such. And, and maybe if you could describe it, it about uh, B2 and 65 dB. I, I did not mean to imply, and, and Chad did not mean to imply, that uh, a noise study could not be done. But from the federal standpoint, in 1974, the federal government adopted noise guidelines and noise compatibility rules for all airports. And the Federal Aviation Administration was put as a responsible agency for those. Since the mid-70s, they have been using a, an integrated noise model to model the noise level of airports and aircraft. The current guideline that the FAA is using, after 40-some years of computer modeling, if you are a general aviation airport and you have fewer than 94,000 annual operations, and you have fewer than 750 jet operations, then they know from their experience that the noise contours are so small that, they, that the noise levels above their threshold of impact or their threshold of significance do not leave the boundaries of the runway safety area on a typical general aviation runway. For that reason, if your airport does not achieve that level of operations or that level of jet traffic, they do not endorse uh, the conduct of a, or running the integrated noise model uh, program. So for that reason, uh, a, an INM, integrated noise model run, was not made for this airport because the Murfreesboro Airport is so far away from that, and uh, the fact that you own, especially on the north end, you own all of the property within that, what used to be called clear zone. That HUD document is old enough. They called it clear zone back then. It's called the runway protection zone. Now, uh, there are no properties in the existing or future runway protection zone on the north end of the airport. And the last uh, email that I had is just regarding, um, it, it goes to the noise, uh, the noise again, and then on depreciated property values that we, and I haven't had a chance to read through all of it, but showing that there was a 29% in reduction on property values, and that's something, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read through. But, I mean, I'm a huge supporter of MTSU. Um, the one thing I just want to make sure with the data that we have that, you know, in a, I guess, putting in an example that we're not widening Avon Lane that's a one-lane road because there may be at some point a resident that's going to buy a big camper on the road. So that's the one thing we just want to make sure that we're not, you know, um, that we're not really for one instance. So, I mean, it's more of a community of things. Right. That's what and, I want to and make that's, sure. And that's where Tim uh, explained that it's not just 
the Jet Stream 31, but it's also the other aircraft that are coming in here. And those numbers combined is what gives us that number for that runway extension. And and that's and that's something I think you should discern as well is that it's not just based aircraft; it's 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 visitors, businesses. Uh, most of your Fortune 500 companies use aviation on a daily basis. And like what uh, Terry was saying was talking about getting his people to Washington, D.C. and back. He did that in one day. Now, if they did it with the airlines, we would have lost the productivity of those people uh, for at least a day and just in travel. And uh, they were able to do that much more efficiently. No per diem, no hotels, no tra You know, they got it taken care of in a, in a cheaper way. And, Terry, I, I was my roommate in college was graduated uh, his name was Wes Hope uh, and he uh, decided that he was going to take me up in the airplane with another one of my roommates and uh, I didn't have a headset and he didn't tell me that he was going to do practice his stall his stalls so to that date I still don't like to get in a plane now <laughs> you might have been better off not knowing <laughs> I'm just well, I did, yeah, that's mind. the bad thing. They were all chuckling up there, but I didn't know we were doing stalls. <laughs> we were doing stalls, so that's a scary, scary feeling. Mr. McFarland, one of the things that we see in, on a normal basis with these airplanes, too, especially the businesses, is Murfreesboro is one stop in the day, and there's three other stops along the way, and and they're, they're checking on their stores, they're checking on their, their people here in Murfreesboro at one of their stores, and. Uh, that that uh, this airport allows them the ability to do that quickly and efficiently. Any other questions or comments? One question, Mr. Young, Mr. Gerke, what percentage of your flights landed after dark? Hmm. Very few. Uh, our, our count on on night operations are very few. I'd say ten percent, maybe less than ten percent. That would vary based on. Summer, winter, whenever, yeah, weather, mm -hmm. and weather. So some days you probably wouldn't have any. Uh, and, and one, I could give you a little bit more specific in that MTSU does, they do operate at night. Um, they have to uh, have the aircraft, I believe, in before midnight. Um, and that they do dispatch some aircraft, but they are back before midnight. Ms. Jones? Just a couple of questions. Um, can you just tell us between the, the King Air and the Jet Stream, if you can take 10 uh, students or faculty, whatever, in the King Air, um, how many can you take in the Jet Stream? What, uh, the, the Jet increase? Stream, I believe, seats 19, is that correct? All the way up to 19. And, and still, that still is considered a B-2 aircraft. It's, if uh, we lined them up next to each other, there would be very little difference in size that you could see, but the seating capacity is, is much greater, as you can see. Okay. And I when bet you, you the seats are smaller, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like what they do at UT in the stadium. They just keep them making them yeah. smaller. <laughs> Where? <laughs> <laughs> that other university. <laughs> And when you were talking about uh, the major airports and, and the, the, some of them that have put these time constraints, mm -hmm. um, I, I know nothing about. Do these type planes also fly into large airports like that? Yes, and, and I don't think they would be restricted. And so they at can that still time. fly in all night. We're, we're that, that restriction is just on the major airlines. Right. So and even in a also. large airport, these type planes are not restricted from flying right. in during, right. now, during the night. There may be some instance where there's an airport that just completely shuts down at night. I, there may be some situations like that, but for the most part, the airline or the cargo is 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 curfewed for a certain period of the night. But the general aviation aircraft are still able to come in because they're just not the noise issue that the larger aircraft are. When we go back to those. Those, those letters for the size of their, the approach speeds and the wingspan, you can mm -hmm. see the difference in the, in the size of the aircraft compared to what we have here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to just make two comments that I'm very proud of, of this group of gentlemen and, and those that aren't here. Um, the Airport Commission acts on the city's best interests and I've seen them time and time again where we'll raise our own hangar rents because it's best for the city and when we look at a, a set of different circumstances we look at what's best for the city which includes the whole city not just the aviating city and so I'd like to make that point that 
the recommendation that's brought before you tonight from the Airport Commission, which is advisory in nature, is that this is the best of the alternatives that we've looked at. We've looked at and studied hard and long hours, a lot of different uh, alternatives, and and this is this is we are not coming saying this is what we want for the aviation community. We're saying this is what we recommend for the betterment of the city. Um, another point that that I wanted to make it and that hadn't really come out specifically is that insurance companies sometimes have different standards for the airport where you're based than they do for the airport where you operate. For example, I used to own a minority interest in a single and the insurance company said you cannot base this airplane on a grass runway, but you can land it on a grass runway. So I think that's an important distinction. The Jetstream 31 that we're talking about can safely land on 3,900 feet that we have, but there's not many or any insurance companies that would insure it on that runway. So I just want to make sure that we don't say we're going to allow something in that can't come in now. It's just that it adds a safety margin. Uh, and for the airport, airplanes that are there now, we haven't talked about it this meeting. We talked about it 17 months ago, but Chad touched on the accelerate stop distance. As there's several Navajos, and, and we fly 421, that somewhere around 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the air gets so thin that if we accelerate to take off speed and have an engine failure at, at break ground speed, and kill the power, somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees, it gets too hot to stop. So we run off the end. So that's the accelerate stop distance that there, there's, I don't know, eight or 10 aircraft that fall into that category that have been based there a long time. So it's, it's a safety issue for all of those people that Terry very adequately said, we, we have a pucker factor as we take off on those hot days. Ms. Jones, did you have another? I just have one more comment, uh, just uh, really to my fellow members on the Planning Commission and the City Council, since I won't get the opportunity to speak in front of you all again. Um, I think that when we uh, get to decision time on this, I think this is one of those things where we need to make a decision on whether, as they've said, this is their recommendation, and either we decide that this is the right thing for us to do, or it's not. I don't think this is a good um, opportunity for us to try to compromise. I don't see any sense in going to the trouble of an air, uh, extending the runway to 4,700 or 4,900 when that 5,000 feet is the point that is huge to the insurance companies. And if it's that big a deal to them, what are we doing by going to the huge expense of extending 4,700 or 4,900, you know, I think we either need to decide this is what we need to do for Murfreesboro or it's not, and not anything in between. That would just be my personal opinion and thought. All right, thank, thank you. you. Any other comments, Mr. Smotherman? I, I, I've got a two-part question, I guess, I, and I'm trying to decide now. The, the usage by MTSU, is it primarily two different usages that we're talking about here? Because it sounds like the King Air we're using for team transportation and movement. It sounds like the most of the training is done in more of a, I don't know enough about planes to have an intelligent conversation here, but it, more of a Cessna type plane or a Piper Cub is what I call it. But if, if we're only talking about one team travel plane that's probably going to come and go on game days, we're really not talking about a plane that's coming in the airport that often, that this particular plane. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, you're, you're right on, on that track there, okay. scheduling. And, and uh, let me explain probably the, the flight training aspect of this larger aircraft. Yes, the majority of the flight training is done in the uh, little diamond aircraft that you see, the low-wing white planes that fly over town. Um, and then there's another set of aircraft that are more complex and, and they have two engines. And the next one is you know, a more complex engine, a more high powered engine that they take training in. The next step that they have, and, and it's, it's for, for some select pilots that Terry brings up with him, is to have that uh, experience of a charter or an airline-like experience of working as a team 
with a pilot and a co-pilot working the radios. There's a lot to do in that cockpit. Cockpit resource management, all those things that they deal with. This is an excellent opportunity to get that students from just flying the aircraft to working as a team member of a flight crew. And this, uh, I, I have a brother-in-law that, that flies, and, and this is a very important opportunity that he allows uh, other students to take part in with him and his flight department to, to get that experience to work with that flight crew. So it is, it is a transport of, of uh, passengers in the university and of teams, but it is also a very important flight training experience as well. For me, as far as before the uh, even the election, when I was recently elected, you were more than happy to sit down with me and explain to me what was taking place out there, and, and I thank you for that. The uh, hopefully my last question: the the uh, if I'm in an accident, the last thing I want to know is when I've had an accident is whether or not I've got insurance. I want to know if everybody's okay. Yeah. And, and in that train of thought. If you know you're safer landing at Smyrna than you are in Murfreesboro, and it's not that far to Smyrna, mm -hmm. I, I'm not so concerned about that one particular plane where it winds up, personally. Mm -hmm. but, but, but in the event of an accident, mm -hmm. would you be safer if there were one, and heaven forbid, if you, would you be safer at Smyrna if something did go wrong? Or would you be safer at Murfreesboro? And the reason I ask that is I contacted the fire departments mm -hmm. and talked to them mm -hmm. about their ability to fight a jet fuel fire and, mm -hmm. and, and their preparedness for this situation should, should the mm -hmm. worst scenario happen. And, and they explained to me that Smyrna has a fire station basically mm -hmm. on the air base. Mm -hmm. Murfreesboro, we don't have that situation. Right. I know we've got one on Memorial, but they're right. not even directly accessed to the airport. Right. It, is it not safer to bring a, th a team plane in at Smyrna than it would be at Murfreesboro, even with the longer runway? Uh, the uh, the fire crew, Fire Station Six, is is the one on Memorial Boulevard, and uh, I, I have had to call them in response. We've actually had a heads up opportunity to know that we have an aircraft coming in that is having a problem, and their response time is is outstanding. Uh, you know, even at Smyrna, the airfield is so large, the uh, the, the fire station is way over here. Well, your accident just occurred three miles off on the airport facility. It's going to take them just as long to get three miles as it does two miles in Murfreesboro. Uh, we have an excellent working relationship. They have the phone capabilities. Uh, station 6 is, a, is a, something that we're, we're very pleased to have. And, and um, another thing is that our fire department, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to say, has, has does do some training to handle aircraft uh, because of the special issues with aircraft fuel and some of the uh, um, tanks, uh, air tanks and things like that that are in the plane. They know where those tanks are. They know where to, where to grab, where not to grab on the aircraft, where they can uh, puncture in and, and, and get somebody out if they had to. So they're doing training. Uh, they're just not always dedicated to aircraft like Smyrna is, but they're doing the training as well. And every year they come onto the airport and do a kind of a retraining, a regrouping of airport layout and of the aircraft. So um, I'm glad they've taken that up themselves, and, and I'm glad to work with them on that. Okay. Um, Again, thank you. Yes. I, there was one thing, uh, Mayor, that uh, the comment was made that uh, this is just for MTSU. and. Uh, Oftentimes when you leave one of these meetings, you think of the things that you wish you had said, and, and one of them actually popped up now, and that uh, one of the companies that, that comes and goes out of Murfreesboro and is based here is Wiser Company, and uh, they sent me a letter talking about the decision that they made to change their aircraft. They purchased a different aircraft because of Murfreesboro. They knew they were going to be in and out of here a lot. They changed their aircraft because of the runway length. And, and they, they were flying a Cessna 340 and were not comfortable with the runway length. They changed aircraft because of that. So it's not just an MTSU issue. There's other base companies like that. They don't base the aircraft here, but they're in and out of here an awful lot. Any other questions or comments? While I've got a captive audience here, um, a couple of things. Number one, I became mayor 10, almost 11 years ago. and. Uh, Eddie, I appreciate starting out with uh, something that might be uh, 
what former Mayor Reeves used to say, controversial. <laughs> it's always fun to come to one of your first meetings and find something controversial. I appreciate y'all having the budget and this in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for looking out for me, Mayor. There must be method to the madness. <laughs> Uh, and I think all of us have raised good questions, and, and certainly I, we get uh, questions like this regardless. I know uh, I live next to a wastewater treatment facility. Uh, I live next to a 500,000 gallon reuse water tower. I live next to a fire hall. I live next to a state training facility for water quality. Uh, so I think all of us who live anywhere are going to find something that they possibly don't like uh, where they live. And obviously I understand these residents um, probably don't like the fact that the airport may possibly sometime in the future uh, have a, a different profile of some type, although I think we have tried to point out that that's not the intention of this extension. Uh, the sole purpose of this extension is that we are going to repave anyway, and while we own the property and while someone else will pay for it, even though all of us will pay for it at some point, just as we pay for everybody's airport, either Minneapolis, Denver, Salt Lake, New York City, wherever in these United States, we all pay for airports. Uh, this improvement will not uh, really change anything for these residents and so I don't think as Ms. Jones has pointed out that a compromise makes any difference. We either need to decide we're going to leave it like it is and just pave what we've got which is going to maintain exactly the same noise profile that we'll have in the future and or we're going to extend it to where it'll be over with and there will be no future extensions done unless we really take on a big lick. And I don't presume that Murfreesboro taxpayers, residents, business owners, or council is going to be interested in doing that. I will tell you, though, that 11 years ago when I ran for mayor, there were two thoughts out at that airport. And those folks who use that airport are very sensitive people and they are sensitive to their own interests, but they're sensitive to the residents around there. There were two thoughts. One was we need to leave the runway like it is because it will raise a stink if we want to go and increase the length with an extension. There will be people who will say, we just need to close that airport and shut it down. And then there was the other set that said, we have the property, we have the ability, why don't we go on and make the improvement now and get it over with, and then we don't have to go back through this again. That's almost the same quandary that a council has or that a state government has on anything that affects us or uh, uh, promotes economic activity or anything else. It, it's just there. It's always there. And there are always going to be folks that are in favor and always going to be those who are not. And I always say there's about 60 percent in the middle who are just, they just need to tip one way or the other because there's 20 that want to do it, 20 that don't. 60 percent in the middle just want to tip. So this is not something that we have looked at lightly. This isn't anything that we have just ginned up in the last two years or three years or five years. It's something that's been there all along. And I would mention that I know some of you probably got a handout in your neighborhood that said your taxes were going to go up. Well, and that property values were going to go down. Let me let me mention two two different things. Number one, you live if you're around the airport in one of the newer sections of Murfreesboro. It's not the newest, but it is one of the newer. And the property taxes in Murfreesboro have remained stable. And in fact, there's been no tax increase in 13 years. And we're about to approve a budget very quickly that will mean no property tax increases in 14 years. And if you look at the property tax rate, it is less because the property values in Murfreesboro across the board in every neighborhood have gone up in the last 13 years. And no property values have gone down as a general rule. 
If you let a property fall into decline, those property values may go down. But if you leave them and take care of your property, your property values in Murfreesboro have gone up. So I'm sorry that uh, this has been disruptive. I, I'm not just sorry for Mr. Smotherman, but I'm sorry for all of us that we've kind of had to go through this. But the more information we share, the more that we look at ourselves and determine what kind of community we want to be and what decisions we want to make to make us that kind of community, there's always somebody else that has a different opinion. And I hope you all understand that and appreciate the fact that we're going to try to look at this in a level-headed way. I want to thank the uh, Airport Commission members here who have participated and for their participation year-round. Uh, if there's nothing else at this time, Mr. Huddleston, I'll ask you to, uh, as chairman of the Airport Commission, to adjourn your Airport Commission meeting. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mr. Lane. Second. Mr. Polk and Mr. Hardison. All in favor? Uh, Airport Commission adjourned. All right. Vice Chair Young of the Planning Commission, would you do the same? Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. All right. City Council members, would you like to adjourn? Or would you like to stay and have another meeting immediately following this one? How about a I, uh, I suggest the second option. <laughs> How about we continue with our uh, council meeting with a five-minute recess? All right. That will be fine. And uh, so city council adjourns, recesses, or continues with regular scheduled meetings. So we will continue with a regular scheduled city council meeting after five minutes. Thank you all for being here. So glad to have all of you here. Please come more often. Please stand by for this. That's what I understand. All right, so we will just continue with the regularly scheduled meeting. We therefore have not had an adjournment and we have had a recess. Do we have a recess? All right, to those of you who are just joining us on City TV, I would like to introduce our, from our uh, St. Mark's Troop 398 uh, Boy Scouts, uh, Coleman Ott and his father, Carl Ott, who are with us today, Assistant Scoutmaster at Troop 398. Did I get that right? Why don't you stand and be recognized? We're happy to have you here tonight. Thank you. And Coleman is working on his citizenship in the community uh, and communications merit badges. Is that correct? Well, we're very happy to have you. And since we did not start the meeting off with a prayer and pledge, would you be able to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Good. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and Carl, thanks so very much for being a scout leader. It's uh, uh, very commendable, and uh, I can remember back in my scout days how much I thought of the person who was leading us and those that went on trips with us and took care of us. It meant a lot to me, and I know your actions and activities will mean a lot to those scouts that you come in contact with, so thank you for doing that. All right. Ms. Scales, you had the prayer, and with, uh, I mean, Ms. Harris, so if you would like to, would you like to have a prayer, or would you like to have a moment of silence? I'll leave you with the option. I'll take the prayer. Now. Thank you. You're welcome. May we bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening just to give thanks for blessing us to see a day that wasn't promised to us, Lord. 
And as we continue to handle the business of the city, we ask that you move among us and give us the direction that you would have us to take. And we pray for all our veterans, all the sick and shut in, all our youth, just everyone in our city, Lord. This is our prayer that we ask in your darling son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And Ms. Wright, you had an announcement you were going to make at the end of the meeting, but since we've just started this one, why don't you tell us about a June 7th uh, budget public hearing and that. Okay. The budget and the public hearing will be advertised uh, for June 7th in the local newspaper, the Murfreesboro Post, on Sunday, May 27th. The public hearing will be based on the budget document discussed without any changes, and then after the public hearing is when the changes will be made. All right. And, and that, that is set for this Sunday. All right. For the advertisement, the advertisement. and mm -hmm. the public hearing is June the 7th. June 7th. 7 o'clock here in the council chambers. And the council members have made several uh, worthy suggestions as to where we might go with that uh, budget document and the individual parts of it. So we'll look forward to that meeting on June the 7th. All right, council members, at this time you have the minutes of the May 16th special meeting, the May 17th special meeting, and the May 17th regular meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to those minutes as they have been presented? Move for approval. Second. All right, you have a motion and second for approval of those minutes. Please call the roll, Ms. Wright. Mr. Gilly. Aye. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. McFarland. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Vice Mayor Washington. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Mayor Bragg. Aye. This time we'll consider for passage on second reading an ordinance to amend the PRD for an area located along Florence Road known as Seward Crossing, formerly known as Fillmore West. So moved. Second. Thank you. A motion and second. Please call the roll. Mr. Gilly. Aye. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. McFarland. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Vice Mayor Washington. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Mayor Bragg. Aye. At this time, we'll consider for passage also on second reading an ordinance amending section 4 43.1 special limited event permit concerning beer. Move for approval. Second. Motion and second. Please call the roll. Mr. Gilly. Aye. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. McFarland. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Vice Mayor Washington. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Mayor Bragg. Aye. At this time, we'll consider for passage again on second reading an ordinance amending Chapter 33, Waters and Sewers, Section 33 1 of the Murfreesboro City Code, dealing with minimum monthly water charges and minimum monthly sewer charges. So moved. Seven. Thank you. A motion and second. Please call the roll. Mr. Gilly. Aye. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. McFarland. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Vice Mayor Washington. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Mayor Brad. Aye. Are there beer permit applications? None tonight. None tonight. All right. Then if not, there are uh, statements before you to be considered for payment. If you've had an opportunity to review those bills to be paid, what are your wishes regarding paying the bills? I move we pay the bills, Mayor. Second. I'll Thank you, Mr. Smotherman. Please call the roll. Mr. Gilly. Aye. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. McFarland. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Vice Mayor Washington. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Mayor Bragg. Aye. What about, uh, so you have no board and commission appointments at this time? Other business from staff or from city council? Mr. Crumley. Mayor, I have two brief recommendations from your community development director, Mr. Callow. The first one is approval of a grant application. Uh, roughly a year ago, you approved us purchasing the eCivis software, which is an alerting mechanism when grants that may have application for the city is available. Uh, we were successful last year in State Farms Foundation grant in the purchase of a boat for the fire department. Uh, after studying their grant program quite thoroughly, uh, we're asking that you approve us to ask for $250,000 to be used in the same manner that your community development block grant funds are used in housing rehabilitation and in uh, down payments for new occupants of, of first-time home buyers. Uh, it is a very key part of State Farm's grant program. Uh, we think we've got a reasonable reason for success and we'd ask your approval there's no match required 
Uh, it would follow along the exact same guidelines as your existing community development block grant program. So you're asking to um, ask State Farms Foundation for this grant? That's correct. Any questions, Mr. Crumley? Grants are good, Mayor. Move for approval. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Washington, call the roll. Mr. Gelly? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. McFarland? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Vice Mayor Washington? Aye. Mr. Young? Aye. Mayor Bragg? Aye. The second one is somewhat easier. Uh, community development is involved in a housing rehab project on O'Brien Drive. As the project was coming to fruition, the water heater failed in the home. And so this is a change order for the project at 2031 O'Brien Drive in the amount of $550 for the purchase and installation of a new hot water heater. Funds are available in the community development budget. Is there a motion? So moved. Gaze. <laughs> Warm water is good. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it's made heated with gas. Is that? Oh no, no, that's not right. <laughs> Do we have a second? Second, Mr. Smotherman. Thank you. <laughs> Please call a roll. Get this over with. Mr. Gilly. Aye. Miss Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. McFarland. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Vice Mayor Washington. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Mayor Bragg. Aye. Any other business from staff or council, Mr. McFarland? While we're talking about uh, community block development, I think we're probably ready for our quarterly report on our NSP houses, if we could yes, sir. have that for us. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? <coughs> anything at all? If not, you're adjourned.